coming to the Cone Lecture. This is our last Cone Lecture of the year. This has been our first year offering these, and we're so excited by how they've gone. We already have all kinds of ideas for next year. Tonight, we are lucky to have two senior graduating speaking fellows here with us to give their presentation. Charlotte Irwin's gonna go first, so I'll introduce each speaker before they speak. Um, and then at the end, we'll have time for Q&A and discussion if anyone has any questions. Can everyone hear us okay? I know there's some background noise. Okay, we're good. All right, so our first speaker tonight is Charlotte Irwin. Charlotte is a neuroscience and psychology double major. Uh, this is her first year as a speaking fellow, and she has already made such a wonderful impression and has helped so many students. Her talk tonight is called Working with Speech Anxiety. So start whenever you're ready, Charlotte. Thank you. 
my physical symptoms are very common for people, whether that be trouble sleeping or losing your appetite or even feeling dizzy or lightheaded, thinking about it more than ever. And obviously those symptoms can be very distressing. Um, it can also manifest in avoidance. So whether this is avoiding going to class on the day of the presentation, even though it can really affect your grade or your group members because you just can't make yourself do it. Or whether it's avoiding applying to certain jobs or certain classes because they require a lot of public speaking. So just being close a lot of doors is something that you can learn how to And I know that's definitely something that I've done before they came into the situation to allow to put myself in work. There's also a lot of coping strategies people tend to do when they're feeling this kind of anxiety that can be counterproductive. Something a lot of people do when a lot of people do when preparing for presentations or public speaking is try memorizing what they want to do word for word. And this makes sense because it can make you feel like you're more prepared. Um, and, but it tends to be very not adapted because like, if I had my presentation memorized word for word and I got distracted for a second and lost my place, I have no idea where to go with that. So it's much better, which we'll talk about more, it's much better to really know your material and um, speak more from the heart. end of that is lack of preparation. And this isn't people being lazy or just not caring. Sometimes it can be so anxiety and <coughs> the thought of putting yourself out there like that that you avoid anything that you see think about, which can include preparing. And I know this is something that I tend to do a lot. And then another is caution. It can be such a stressful thought and you are so sure that you're going to fail on it that it makes your performance worse. This is all this is all this. So, what are helpful ways of coping with this anxiety? The first thing is that preparation is key. Um, if you put work into something, you know what you're going to talk about. You're confident in your presentation. That takes away a lot of anxiety. Feeling unprepared, feeling self-conscious, worrying about what you're thinking about what you're talking about. And I know I'm someone that procrastinates a lot, so it's important for you to find this for myself accountable. So if you're not someone that can like, set a deadline for yourself, and you know if you're anxious and you're the last minute, it's going to find other people or other things that will set a deadline for you. Like, I knew if I if I didn't have like, something to be accountable, I probably would have started my presentation today because I was really nervous for it. So I started meeting with Amy a few days ago so that I would be forced to prepare before me. This can be anyone in terms of speaking fellows, you can be with a professor, um, you can be with like, a friend that's really short or something, I don't know, but just find a way to force yourself to do it beforehand so you can put the maximum effort into it. Reflection is also important. Sometimes this kind of anxiety can exist as a really general thing. Once you start to question it and why you're so scared in the first place, it can make you remember that it's really not as scary as you think it is. So taking time to do is really important. Acceptance is also important. It's, it's hard to change your feelings or make your anxiety go away. I'm trying to do so you can be really exhausting. So if you just accept that you're feeling anxious, it's a scary thing, and use that anxiety to channel it into putting the rest of the world as prepared as you can, showing that you've done your work as much as you can. It can actually be helpful. And then a few things that I have to remind myself of is that you're always more critical than your audience. When you're up speaking in front of a lot of people, you're fixating on every single thing you say, everything you do, your body language. But people watching you probably aren't. You know that because I mean, you probably don't do that to other people. Um, and often, the lead up is worth some presentation itself. I've been dreading this for a couple weeks and I'm on right now. So <laughs> you just gotta, gotta push through. I know that you'll be. Um, the last thing is that it's a pain to scare all the way. So a lot of people feel this, and it's normal, but it doesn't mean that just because you feel it doesn't mean that it's going to happen. So, just a few final words. Um, for me, dealing with this worry and being able to push through is a reminder that I can't control it. I can't control how we feel about things and that we're afraid of. But how we respond to it, or we can try to do it. And often, the most intimidating things 
when we're able to push through and work with our feet around them, it tends to be the most gratifying and makes you feel proud of ourselves. Yeah. Oh my god. that literally within an hour you were texting me saying <laughs> I don't want to do it. Yeah. But she did it and that's the lesson. You can do it scared and you can do an awesome job. <laughs> Next up we have Jacob Walters who is a senior political science and psychology double major. Jacob trained as a speaking fellow when he was a first year in college in spring 2020 which was a very memorable semester. So he has been an active tutor for three years now. He is 10 sessions away from holding the all-time speaking fellow session record and would really love to hit that. So if you have any sort of public speaking things you want to work on in the next few weeks, Jacob Walters, try to hit that up. Um, if we could get a little bit less noise from the rest of ISO, if anyone hears, you don't have to be totally silent, but if we could be a little quieter, that would be awesome. Thank you. Take it away, Jacob. Fellow. Where's your um, no yeah, I don't have any visual aids. If you've ever seen me try to do visual art, it's for the best that I don't have any visual aids. Um, so thank you guys for coming. Um, I heard about the Cone Lectures in September as well. I've had a vague idea of what I've wanted to do since then. So it's very exciting to put it into um, real life. Uh, I'm the last to go, which is both very exciting and very intimidating because I've seen a lot of the other speaking fellows um, teach a lot of the skills from the class, um, teach a lot of the skills that we use as tutors. Um, and while I was watching theirs, I realized that mine was gonna be a little bit different from that. So mine's gonna be a lot less technical, a lot less teaching, and honestly a lot more personal because uh, it's really just about my experience as a speaking fellow for the last three and a half years. Um, like Amy said, I've been doing this for a long time uh, and I just, kind of wanted to share it with you guys. Um, one of the things that the Speaking Fellows has also taught me is that uh, I can really only speak from my own experience and my own story, so I hope that resonates with you guys, I hope you, that makes you reflect, I hope you take something away from that, but I'm not gonna teach or prescribe based on my own experience, because uh, I don't think that really makes sense. Um, so just to give you an idea of where we're going for the first half, I'm gonna talk about who I was before college and who I still am to a certain extent. And then for the second half, uh, I'm gonna talk about how the speaking fellows fundamentally influenced that and changed that. Um, so to start all the way back at the beginning and to talk about myself as a baby, actually, um, to put it bluntly, I was uh, a devil baby. Um, I have never once in 22 years heard my parents say one positive thing about me as a kid, or as a baby more specifically. Like, no, like, oh, you were so cute. Like, no, oh, you brought a lot of joy into our life, like a lot of parents say, like, no, like, none of that. And every time we meet somebody who knew me as a baby, they are on the same page that I was a zero out of 10 baby. Um, so everybody else agrees on that apart from me. Um, but my mom does tell this one story that um, shows me in a more favorable light and sort of marks my, the end of my devil period. And I actually asked her to write it out and send it to me so that I wouldn't butcher the telling. So I want to read a little bit of it to you guys now. Okay, so it's my mom's words, keep that in mind. Um, it was a beautiful weekend day in August 2002 and we decided to leave our cr cramped London home for a day out in the beach town of Brighton, a train ride away. As I packed up 18-month-old Jacob and all his stuff, I kept thinking, why are we doing this? Jacob is gonna scream the whole day and this is gonna be an absolute nightmare for me. Because you have to understand, Jacob was a screamer. He started screaming at zero days old and pretty much stopped only when he was asleep, which was exceedingly rare. And he didn't just scream, he would routinely scream so long and so hard that he would pass out, regaining consciousness only after a minute or two. The best example of this was when we went on a trip to South Africa and we left him with a babysitter who had hundreds of children's worth of experience. She called us back within five minutes and said, I quote, I can't do this job because that child is the devil. <laughs> anyway, here we were heading to Brighton on the train with me fully prepared for the worst. 
and then the worst didn't happen. Instead, Jacob sat contentedly on my lap, looking around, looking out the train windows, pointing at every passing house, car, cloud, and cow, each time asking, what's that? What's that? I duly told him what those things were, and he would move on to the next thing. The whole day in Brighton, uh, and the whole way back, he was angelic. What had happened to my devil child? We figured it out later. I'd been keeping a little notebook in which I had been recording the words Jacob had learned. It's very on brand for my mom, if you know her. Uh, and that day, he was up to 50 words. There may not have been a special magic about that round number 50, but it soon became clear that those words were enough for Jacob to say many of the things that mattered to him. Clearly his screaming had been out of frustration that he couldn't express himself. So I tell you that story for pretty much the last line of my mom's story, that uh, I've always had a lot to say, I've always had a lot to share, and been very expressive. Um, and this carried into me being a kid as well. So I'm not sure things got a lot better for my family because I went from being the baby who would never shut up because I would never stop screaming to the kid who would never shut up because I would never stop talking. <laughs> So I always had a lot to say, and frankly, I didn't care very much about what others had to say, even into being a teenager. Um, and a lot of my friends in the crowd tonight would probably attest that I'm still really talkative and still have a lot to say, but I don't think they would say about me, and I definitely wouldn't say about myself, that I don't care about what others have to say anymore. Um, and I think a big reason for this uh, is the speaking fellows. Obviously, there are a lot of forces at play, and the world has just sort of like forced me to mature, but the Speaking Fellows is a huge part of what changed me in college, I think. Um, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about my story as a Speaking Fellow now. So I applied in my freshman year during Meliora Weekend. Um, and to be honest, I could not tell you why I applied. Um, my parents saw a flyer. They said, that looks cool. I said, yeah, that looks cool. And I applied. Um, if I'm being honest, the word speaking being in the title probably played a lot of a role. <laughs> Um, and I thought at the time, yeah, I like talking, I like speaking, like I would like to improve my speaking skills and my talking skills. Um, but I realized really quickly in the training class in my spring semester that it wasn't going to be about that at all, and it was going to be about something a lot more interesting. So I remember on the first day of class, sitting in class, I was the only freshman, and there were uh, seven people older than me, I was kind of intimidated. And I remember Amy um, uh, laid out pretty much everything we were going to learn uh, on the whiteboard or at least the philosophy of what we were going to learn. And I'm a visual learner, so this, this was awesome. Um, and the moment I saw that ball board, um, I realized that this wasn't going to teach me how to talk better, this was going to teach me how to listen better. Um, and honestly, from that moment on, I bought in. Um, I remember like the visceral excitement I had reading those first few readings. Like These are readings for a class. And I was like genuinely excited to read them. Um, because they were about the philosophy of non-directive communication, which kind of underpins everything we do as speaking fellows. So non-directive communication is a much more other-oriented way of communicating with people. It's about listening and guiding and facilitating rather than directing and teaching and instructing, which you might get a, a more typical tutor session. And I loved reading about this theory because it showed me that there was another way to have conversations or a better way to have conversations for myself. But not only that, when I became a speaking fellow, I got to practice this. Um, the, the practice or the sessions forced me to practice that type of communication. I actually once told one of my good friends who I was recruiting to apply to be a speaking fellow at the time that um, speaking fellows is two hours or four hours dedicated in my week to helping someone else with their communication needs and achieve their communication goals. Um, and I love this because it forced me to do it. And it made me start to think, um, why don't I do this in my real life more often? I think I can be quite directive a lot of the time. I think it shows up a lot in the way I give advice. So if somebody comes to me for advice, um, I'm gonna push them towards an expected outcome a lot of the time. I'm gonna push them to what I think is best for them. And then when they don't do that, it really upsets me or it really angers me. Um, but something that stuck with me that a graduated speaking fellow uh, told me, Monica, um, she told me, uh, even before I'd even done a session, why she loved the Speaking Fellows was because it made her realize that when people come to her for advice, they're not really asking for advice. They're asking yeah. for you to listen and lay out the options and ask the right questions. And if you give them advice, they're going to do what they want to do anyway. Um, and so I got to ask myself, why can't I do this outside of the tutoring room? And I, 
I, I do more now, and I do take it outside of the tutor group. But I think it boils down to a need for control. Um, so control is always something I've wanted, always something I've needed, always something I've had issues with. And I think that that led me to talk a lot and scream a lot when I was a baby. Because when you're talking, you're controlling the conversation, you're defining the direction of it, uh, you're defining the topic of it. Um, and the Speaking Fellows has been the one thing consistently in my time in college to force me to let go of that control. And maybe you would contend that I let go of the control because I get paid for it, or maybe you'd say I let go of it because I have an obligation to do the job. I would contend that I do it because it's rewarding. Um, and I think the reason that it's rewarding is that it's taught me a lot about other people as well. So what I've learned about myself is that I can give up control in conversations. And what I've learned about other people is that when I give them that room and I give them that space, they always have something really interesting and personal to say. So I think the best way of summarizing this is in my favorite kind of speaking fellow session, which is an interview session. Um, so when people come in for mock interviews, surprise, everyone hates interviews. It's just a human condition. Um, and they come in pretty anxious, and I talk to them for a little bit about their experiences with interviews and what they feel about them, and then I ask them the classic question that you will get in, at the beginning of every single interview, which is, tell me about yourself. And it's a weird question. How often do you have a free hit to just talk about yourself? Like, never, right? Or not in social situations, because we generally don't give that room to each other. Um, and every time I ask it, or almost every time, they generally answer with their resume first. So they tell me what they did, the jobs they've held, that cool internship that they held. And then I always ask them, well, why did you do those things? And I think talking about the why, not the what, is a lot more personal. It's a lot more uncomfortable. Um, it gets into the type of person that you are, which is what they're really asking. But if I give them that space and I ask them that question, they always have something interesting to say. They have some childhood story about why they picked the major that they did, or they have some cool connection about how they learned about this job and why they really want to do it. Um, and I think I've realized that if I can do this in the tutoring room, I can do it outside of the tutoring room, and I can give people the room to say what they're feeling, and it's gonna end up in more interesting and more effective conversations. So to conclude, I just wanna thank the speaking fellows for letting me do this for the last three years. Uh, to all my friends as well, uh, for understanding how important this is to me. Um, and to Amy, thank you so much. Uh, you've been the best boss I could ask for. I will carry this with me. Next year as a teacher, I'll carry this 10 years down the road when I'm doing whatever as a parent, as a grandparent. Like, you've given me like a new way of give, uh, having conversations and I think that's the greatest gift I could have had in college. Do we have any questions for Jacob or Charlotte about speech anxiety? Oh, got one. Um, so when you have a really short presentation class where you have to like, hit a bunch of points on a rubric and you kind of have to memorize it, but you're anxious about it, do you have any ways to not necessarily do that like work from working where you might get lost, but also be able to hit that like, time stamp that you have to measure? Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, that's a really good question. I'm like, the, whenever I'm preparing for a speech, I always like break down everything into like bullet points or an outline. Like, I make sure, because I know if I, if I write things out too much, I'll just try to memorize it. So I do to do things that I definitely don't like memorize things and I'll like practice like reading through my outline, like saying things, you know, in accordance with that. But, um, I think just like having that line and focusing on like knowing that and still putting it in time. Um, so Jacob, I, I want to ask a, a question I don't necessarily think has like a definitive answer necessarily, but. Like, how do you think maybe speaking fellows has helped that you know when to talk and when to listen? That's a hard question. <laughs> um, <laughs> sorry. No, 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 it's fine. Um, 
I think the root practice of it for sure. I think you're asking more about like specific moments that I would notice that. Um, I think um, body language is a lot. So I think when somebody gets rolling about something that they're really feeling, um, they're like dead moments where they like, I don't know, where they might want to get cut off, but like don't really, I guess. And I feel like oftentimes it's like in like their facial expression as to whether they um, like really do want to get cut off. And I guess what I'm trying to get across is like, if you let somebody talk, like, like they will talk if they're really like into something. And I think that like, uh, it's actually, um, over, uh, over the summer, my summer camp director, she's like, a, she's been a therapist for a very long time for kids, and she gave me the advice to just kind of like uh, be with them. And I was like, oh, like I am, like I'm with them, like you know, I'm physically there. And then she was like, no, like you're not as present with them as you could be. And um, I think that she gave me advice on my own body language to sort of like lean forward when people are sharing something with me. Uh, and that's something I do more often in sessions now. And I think the more you can be like, more than just physically present, the more uh, you'll recognize when people really do want to share or not. But it's not a very good answer because it, 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 I, I think it's so variable. Um, thank you for the <laughs> wonderful presentations. I think my question is like, since uh, both of you are graduating, um, what advice do you have for current uh, speaking fellows and for upcoming uh, speaking fellows? Um, yeah. Everything I just said. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know. Um, I think it's a really fun job. Um, it's one of the few things on campus that is like not that big of a time commitment, but you can still get a lot out of it because for those like, two hour shifts, like you really have to be on. And I think that's cool, and I think you should tell other people so they can continue to recruit them. I think I would say that, I mean, you already know that we're not the same technical skills and stuff as me. I would say that, like, in the tutoring room, like, just being kind and important is, like, the most important thing. Because, like Jacob said, like, people already kind of know what they're going to get out of it, and they just want to feel like, heard and encouraged. So like always like prioritizing like being nice and being comfortable so that it goes it. I think it's like the most important thing. Like more important than always saying the perfect thing or giving a perfect advice. I have a question for Jacob. Um so we were talking about like giving advice to your friends and then they don't follow it and getting really angry. So like how do you get better at not having that extreme emotional reaction when you give your friends really detailed advice, but then they completely ignore it and do the opposite. <laughs> I don't think. I, yeah, I don't think I'm better at it. <laughs> um, I guess maybe I'm better at it than when I was a baby. Um, I I really don't know. I I um I think uh, recently I, I had a conversation with a friend about just that. And they told me, well, it's not your life. And that's kind of just what I like repeat to myself over and over again, because it's not. And then if you flip the situation, like how many times have I not taken my friend's advice, right? <laughs> Plenty. Um, so I don't know. I, I think there's room for like generosity and charity there, because I'd probably do the same kind of thing. Thank you all for coming and join us next year for more code lectures and we have some training speaking fellows in the crowd who will get to come up with their own topics. Awesome. Have a good night.